angels always talks about the righteousness of God towards human beings to save them from sin and death and give them life as a gift. And it prophesied of the work God would do. It prophesied of God doing this work to save human beings from death and to give them glory and immortalities in their physical bodies. And the reason he would do it is because he loves them. And so the law pointed to that and talked about it, but it wasn't the actual work that did it, right? So the work still had to occur, right? And that's kind of like what Paul would come and say, is the law against the promises of God? Certainly not. Certainly not. Now, why would he say it's not against the promises of God? Because it's talking about the promises of God. Right? right? What we've done is, in come in, and it's not that it's bad, because we, we come into a revelation of grace, but we, what we did when we first come into a revelation of grace, we would believed on the grace before we understood all the things. And so then we kind of form our understanding around that. Right? And so we look at the law, and because we still didn't see the law accurately, because we just started understanding it's not by our works, it's by grace, we looked back at the law and still looked at it with the carnal mind and didn't see what it was actually saying. But they have those discussions in church, are we still under the law, or are we right. not under the law? Right. As if it's a separate thing. As if it's a separate thing. What would be accurate to say is, are we still performing the works of the law or not? Mm. Right? Because back then, the, 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 the works of the law, are we still looking to the works of the law? No, we're looking to Christ. He is the work that the law prophesied of. Right. So now that Christ has come, we look at him, right? But even now that I see him, when I look back at the Old Testament scriptures, I now see the interpretation of what they were talking about, right? So I can even go back now and look there and talk about those scriptures from the perspective of what I see in Christ. And they're, they line up, right? They line up, right? But even if I saw, even though Jesus saw the goodness of God in the law, even though Jesus saw the work that God would do and why he would do it, and this is the easiest one, and I use it a lot. And I made posts on Facebook, and I know people don't, they're struggling to understand what I'm saying because we so long thought, and this is the problem, we think the law is the enemy of man, right? But like the Feast of first fruits. When Jesus saw the Feast of first fruits, he didn't say, I need to give an offering from the, fir the first of my increase so that the rest will be blessed. He saw the Feast of first fruits and said, this isn't about giving God barley so we can have a nice uh, fruit crop. He's all, this is about God is going to raise me from the dead in a glorified immortal body. And I'm going to be the firstborn from the dead. And God's going to take me, when he raises me from the dead, seat me at his right hand. And the reason God's going to do that is because he's going to give himself an assurance that he's going to have many sons and daughters that will also be raised from the dead. And so Jesus saw that's what the law was saying. He didn't see it as a carnal thing he would do. He saw the work God would do. Now listen, God still had to do the work though. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Jesus didn't look on what that said and say, hey, well, that's it. No, no, no. He looked on that and saw a work would still need to be done. So even though we could see the truth in the Old Testament scriptures, the work still had to be done, right? That, those works of the law, even though they spoke of the work God would do in Christ, those works of the law could never raise us from the dead. Only God could do that. And he still had to do it. Do you see what I'm saying? And so when we see that they're the same, it's not to discount that Christ had to come. It's not to say that he didn't really have to come. It's not even to say that the only reason he had to come was to interpret. Because a work actually had to happen. We don't want to get busy with Gnosticism, wherein we think that something didn't actually have to happen. We just had to change the, our, our view. Right? No, something actually had to happen, and what actually happened changed our view. <laughs> Do you see how that works? If Christ had never come and conquered death, we could, we could try to change our are thinking all we like. We could get into New Ageism and try to will ourselves unto life. We could meditate all we want. We could stand by the water all day long trying to feel peace. None of that could have brought us out of the grave. Right? right? right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does everybody understand what, what, what we're saying there? Because that's a lot of complicated doctrinal things that we're, we're saying there. And really underneath it all, it's a very simple thing we're trying to say. The word of God has always been the same. It's always been Jesus. God never changed his mind. He, he, he's not schizophrenic. There's no shadow of turning in him. He never spoke one word and then changed his mind and spoke another word. 
He was always speaking the same word. He was always speaking the word of eternal life. He was always talking about how he loves man so much that when he walked by them, even after they were dead in their sin, his heart said it's the time of love. And because they took his breath away when he walked by them, he came and spread his skirt over them. That's a marriage symbol. He came to join himself to them. Right? He came to do a work to, re- to join himself to them in their death so that they could be joined to him in his life when Jesus was raised from the dead. Right? They were always talking about that. And any interpretation of the scriptures that is outside of that is in error. And what it does is, is it leaves us in instability. It leaves us with an unstable heart. It leaves us double-minded. You know, James talked about not being double-minded. A double-minded person is tossed to and fro. Well, guys, I don't know if you realize it, but we've, even in grace, preached God as if he was double-minded. Now listen, it doesn't matter how much you don't want to be double-minded. If your view of God is that he was double-minded, if your view of the scriptures is that they are double-minded, then you're going to be double-minded, whether you want it or not. That's what's going to be established in your heart is a double-minded kind of a thing. And any type of double-minded, it leads to instability, right? And instability leads to being tossed to and fro with every doctrine, every form of doctrine, right? It's like you're standing there with the flower. She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. Do you think that person ever feels the stability of she loves me? No, because they're right next to she loves me not. Right? (laughs) And so you see how that's double-minded? And so there's no stability there. In fact, even when you're done with the flower, you think, well, where's the next flower I can grab? We're still busy with it. And that's the way we've taught the Old Testament, even trying to believe on grace, even after we come into grace, leaves people with a subconscious double-mindedness going on. God was this way, now he's that way. God talked this way there, now he talks this way. Right? And it it causes uh, instability. And it causes confusion and it causes people to look into the Old Testament scriptures to pluck out doctrines that aren't really there because they're still trying to read it with the carnal mind. So the Old Testament scriptures are all the time prophesying of Christ and him crucified, right? The work of God. Every work of the law is talking about the work of God. What is the Sabbath talking about? You think it's talking about observing a day so you can be blessed by God? You know what the Sabbath is talking about? The work that's needed for you to have blessing in life is finished. And God did it. And he come and given you blessing in life as a gift. Now, do you know when you see that, you know what will happen to you? You'll rest. That's why Jesus would come and say, the man is not for the Sabbath, the Sabbath is for man. And so even the Sabbath was prophesying. I mean, when did God, when did God rest in Genesis? At the end, after he made man and everything was done for man, everything that man needed for life and God-likeness was complete, God had done the work, and now he was trying to woo man to enter into his rest. And so the Sabbath is prophesying of the work God would do. What work needed to be done? We're dying. Our bodies are dying. The word righteousness means a condition acceptable to God. We always thought the condition acceptable to God is that we would be doing all the right things. That's not the condition. The condition acceptable to God is that you were formed in your mother's womb and created to live eternally in love and not die. And so the condition acceptable to God is for you to possess eternal life. Well, guess what? We didn't have eternal life. We're dying. And so that wasn't acceptable to God. It wasn't acceptable to God for you to be in a condition where your body's perishing, and because your body's perishing, you're filled with fear. It wasn't acceptable to him. So God said, a work needs to be done. What work needs to be done? Well, a work needs to be done to overcome that death in their body. Because when they can see that death has been overcome in their body by what I've done, and that the reason I've done is because I love them, that fear will be plucked out of their heart. Now they can possess eternal life, and fear can be replaced with my love for them. That will be a condition acceptable to me. So he comes and does that work. And he does that work right in front of us. And then he comes talking to us about that work so that we could be put to rest. That's the Sabbath. Now you see how in the Old Testament scriptures, it looks like it's talking about a day we're going to observe. And it's got to be a specific day. And not only has it got to be a specific day, but we can't be doing anything on that kind of a day. 
We can't pick food. It don't matter if we're starving to death. We can't put food. We can't help a guy who's fallen down uh, broken in the street because we can't do any work on the Sabbath. If one of our animals falls in a ditch, we just got to leave him there to die because we can't do it. It had nothing to do with that. Right? And so do you see how the Sabbath was talking about the word of eternal life? What word? The word that was from the beginning. <laughs> this is the word that was from the beginning. Right? That word never changed. What changed was our hearts became veiled, right? Our sight became veiled. We couldn't see God for who he was. We couldn't see ourselves for what God thought of us. God knows the thoughts and intentions that he feels for us. He said that in the Old Testament. And do you know what he says his thoughts and intentions towards us are? Shalom. Thoughts of goodness and kindness. Thoughts to be well with us. Thoughts to do well to us, to give us a confident expectation of eternal life. That was in the Old Testament, that was his thought. But we read the Old Testament, we think his thought is he wants to kill a bunch of people because he's an angry dad and he's got to spank somebody. That's how we read the Old Testament. Jesus didn't read that. Jesus looked at the Old Testament scriptures and he said, I see sin is serving mankind with death. And I see God is the savior of mankind. And I see that God, not only does he desire to save mankind, he possesses the ability to save mankind. And so Jesus is put to rest by reading the Old Testament scriptures, seeing what's written there is the work of God to overcome the death he was going to absorb into himself on the cross. That put him to rest on the cross. That same word is in the Old Testament. And so what we want to be busy with is the same word. And we want to be looking for the same word in all the scriptures. And as a foundational understanding that can help us in our lives when we're exposed to other teachings, other teachers, other doctrines, when we're reading the Bible for ourselves and reading the scriptures, we want to know what exactly it is we're reading. And if we can't see it there, we want to at least know, well, this ain't right. Do you see what I'm saying? Because then we can stop and inquire with God. Lord, what is this saying? I know it's got to be saying something within the scope of the word that was made flesh in Jesus. Right? What word was made flesh in Jesus? The word that was from the beginning? The word that's in the Old Testament scriptures. Right? So now that word that's in the Old Testament scriptures became flesh in Jesus so we could behold it and see what it was saying all along. What do we behold in Jesus? What killed Jesus on the cross? Does it say Jesus took the anger of the Father upon himself at the cross? It most certainly does not say that. When John the Baptist laid his hands on Jesus, the lamb that would take away the sin of the world, he laid the sin of the world on Jesus. In the Old Testament, the high priest didn't lay the anger of God on the lamb. He laid the sin of the world. So the wages of sin is death. And so we see in the word made flesh, sin is bringing death to this man, Jesus. Well, this man, Jesus, is a man, and I'm a man. And I mean ladies, too. He's a human. Well, I see this man, Jesus, is dying on the cross, and sin is what's doing it to him. So I see this death I had and the death I see in the Old Testament scriptures, it hasn't come from God. It's actually come from this thing called sin. And then I see in the Word made flesh in Jesus that the Father is the one who saves people from sin, not the one who condemns people because they have sin. How do we know that? Because this guy's dead in sin. And the Father doesn't come and dump six more feet of dirt on top of him. The Father comes and brings him out of the dirt. And doesn't just bring him out of the dirt and say, let's see if you can get it right now. He brings him out of the dirt and clothes him in a body that can never die again. That's the word made flesh. What word? The word in the Old Testament. That's the thing in the Old Testament. And that was made flesh in Jesus. So when we read the Old Testament scriptures, we want to be able to see what it is we're actually using to interpret what's written there. And if you're not using the word made flesh in Jesus to interpret what's written there, you're going to get it all wrong. And that's why many well-intentioned people get it all wrong. Because they want to read the Bible like a novel. Right? And they want to just read each chapter in the Old Testament like it's not talking about a specific thing. It's talking about whatever I think it is. <laughs> no, it's not whatever we think is being talked about there. It's the intent of the author. When you go into an art gallery and you look at art, I mean, you can look at the painting and you can decide what you think is there. And you can decide what it means to you. But the artist can come and stand next to you. And you can start talking to them about the painting that they painted. 
And they can start telling you what was in their heart when they painted the painting. And you could start experiencing it, right? That's how the scriptures are. It's like a master artiste that painted this beautiful picture. We're busy looking at it, determining what we think it means. And then the artist is God. And he comes in the flesh and stands next to us and says, let me tell you what that really is. And now we see, right? And we have the artist interpreting his work for us instead of us trying to interpret it. Yeah, right? without the artist, there is no interpretation. Exactly. You cannot have an interpretation. It's only whatever you think it is. An opinion. That, that's right. And, and that's what Paul would talk about with rightly dividing the scriptures. Mm -hmm. There's a way they're intended to be read. And if you don't have that, or if you don't use that, you're going to get it wrong. That's what he's talking about. We talked about the whole counsel of God. We consider the whole counsel of God when we think about the scriptures. We don't just consider this and not consider that. We don't take a little bit of this and a little bit of that. We take the whole counsel of God, and then we let that tell us about God. It's the whole counsel, right? We want to weigh this over here without looking at it in light of this. Do you see how that's not taking the whole counsel of God? So we have the Old Testament scriptures, and we want to weigh those without weighing them in light of the word made flesh in Jesus. And then we get it all wrong. We get it all screwy. And so taking the whole counsel of God is, is that I'm not going to weigh the Old Testament scriptures on their own. I'm going to use this light that entered the world as the thing that's going to animate these Old Testament scriptures. Now I'm reading the scriptures through the whole counsel of God. It's like if somebody writes on the wall with a black light marker, like an invisible marker, and you need a black light to read what's there. Right? You can't read what's there without the black light. If I try to consider what's written there without the black light, I'll, who knows what I'll come up with. Someone tells me there's something there and I don't see it. Listen, I might be like the emperor's clothes and I just lie and say I see something. <laughs> and then who knows what I'll make up. And so taking the whole, considering the whole counsel of God is that whatever doctrine you're going to weigh, whether it even be connected to the church or even in the world, because there's a lot of doctrine everywhere. A doctrine is just a teaching about how you're going to attain to something. We want to weigh if we're implementing or considering a doctrine in our lives about how we're going to attain to something, we want to weigh all doctrine in light of the word made flesh in Jesus. All of it. Because that will give us great discernment. It will give us eyes to see. And it will help us. It will be profitable to us in every walk of our life. Right? It will give us a sound mind. Yeah, we won't be double-minded. We won't be double-minded. You know, double a friend of... Uh, me yesterday and said, uh, can you look at something for me? And I said, sure. I, uh, I'll come over after church. And he texted me back and said, church is not plural. <clears throat> you, you can't come after church. You're bringing the church. <laughs> you are the church. Yeah. You know, and, I, and I text back, you know, the truth always makes you smile. <laughs> and we bought, uh, we bought uh, my son uh, this new finished carpenter's belt. <clears throat> and on it, I'm going to engrave um, more than a carpenter. Um, because I tell him all the time, you're the son. You're the son. So every time he straps that belt on, he's going to see that written. I'm going to, I'm going to put it upside down. So every time he puts that belt on, he'll see more than a carpenter. More than a carpenter, yes. And, and there's so much stuff I left out with the Beatitudes. But it, it's, it's all throughout the scriptures. You remember the woman caught in adultery that, that Glenn so beautifully put, put it up, talked about? Do you know when that happened? It was on the last day of the great feast, and I talk about this a lot. But you know what they were celebrating on that last day of the great feast? The Torah. They were celebrating the Torah, the Old Testament scriptures, to be with them as a light and a lamp unto their feet. Now, they weren't just celebrating that part of the Torah. They do something else on that last day of the great feast. It's in Jewish culture that Gentiles don't even know about. They're doing something else called Simcha Torah. You know what they're doing on Simcha Torah? They're celebrating the end of the previous Torah cycle and the beginning of a new Torah cycle. They're celebrating the end of the previous year's Torah cycle and the beginning of a new Torah cycle. Where they're going to go through the understanding of the Torah. Well, it's in that place that Jesus stands up in the middle of this great feast, and you know what he says? I am the light of the world. 
And before he does that, he writes on a stone in the temple with his finger. He's God. Who wrote on the stone? The finger of God, it says. They're presuming to understand the law. Jesus is telling them, guys, this is the finger that wrote on the stone. I'm the one that knows what the law means. I'm actually the lawgiver that Isaiah prophesied of. Isn't this Zion? Well, here I am. And this law is about to come forth. And so he stands up and declares himself to be the law of God, the Torah. I am the light of the world. What's he saying? Notice how he does that right in coherence with them celebrating the end of an, uh, the previous Torah cycle and the beginning of a new one. What is he saying? He's saying, listen, guys, you guys have always read the Torah this way. Well, I'm here to tell you there's going to be a new way to read Torah from now on. He was signifying the beginning of a new way to understand the law and the prophets because he was going to come teaching what they actually said, which is not a new commandment, but an old commandment, which is like what John would say. And then you think, well, how can it be new and old at the same time? Well, it's new because we didn't think it was that. It's old because it was always that. And now we see it. A new covenant I give you. Yes. He's saying you don't see it. We don't see it. And he actually had to shed his blood His blood actually had to run out of his flesh so that we could be divorced from death, right? We had to be set free from death and able to be able to have life by the spirit, right? We had to be divorced from our union to death to be able to be joined to God in his spirit, right? Does that make sense? And so the new covenant, Paul would come and say, he said, in the new covenant, remember, Simcha Chora, what did Jesus do? He signified the end of an old way of reading the Old Testament scriptures, and he signified the beginning of a new way to understand the Old Testament scriptures. Well, what does Paul come and say? In the new covenant, we're ministers of the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. Why? Because Jesus came and on Simcha Torah stood up and declared himself to be the Torah. Oh, wow, this guy's the Torah? That's not the Torah? Holy smokes. Now we see there's a new way to interpret Torah. And now that's the new thing that we're teaching, which isn't new, but it's old. Because God doesn't change. (laughs) Right? Now we're busy with all these kinds of different things and it's got us all all over the place. Something beautiful will happen inside of you when the thing gets all comprised down to this one thing. It's about Christ and him crucified. There's a word that was made flesh there. What is it? Now you're not all over like this. Now you're right here. What's in there? Now you're talking talking with God. What's in there, man? You know what will happen? You'll see what's in there. (laughs) You'll start to see what's in there. And your mind will be flooded with it. You'll be flooded with the wisdom of God. You'll be flooded with the discernment of God. Everything will begin opening up to you. And you won't really know how. You just know that it is. That's just what's happened to me. Right? And you'll see it. But we, we've got everything so diluted. Right? You notice what Paul said? Paul, the man who knew, who understood more things than any human that walked the earth, maybe outside of, definitely outside of Christ. But maybe you, you people could argue David or whatever. Oh, glory to God. That, not for me because Paul lived after the resurrection. But listen to what Paul said. Now, he had more understanding than everyone. You know what he said? I purpose to know one thing in your midst, Christ and him crucified. What? Do you, do you see what he's saying there? He's saying, I didn't go off here and study eschatology. I didn't go off here and study that. I didn't go off here and study this. I didn't go over there and study that. I didn't go over here to study this. I didn't go over there to study how to be a good counselor or how to do this or how to do that. He said, what I did was, is I saw Christ in him crucified. And I counted everything else as dung for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ in him crucified. And what he's saying there is, that gave me wisdom about everything. That gave me understanding about everything. Because after all, that is Alpha and Omega. Do you know what Alpha and Omega means? The beginning and the end. And all things in between. Okay, so within Christ is contained all the wisdom of God. I said all the wisdom of God. Not some, all. And you get your heart and your mind set on that, man, you'll find yourself dwelling in wisdom. And you'll even get happy because you'll think, How did I get this wisdom? How do I even understand these things? As I'm even talking to people sometimes, I'm thinking, 
How do I even know that? How does it even come out? And I'm even marveling sometimes as I'm talking because I never heard it like that before. And all I can say is that it's Christ and him crucified dwelling in you and it gives you discernment about all things and it may give you discernment about a situation you never encountered before. But you have Christ so you know all things. And so the moment anything is confronted by the wisdom of Christ and him crucified, that wisdom just discerns it all. There you go. And then you come together and you're like, man, you see how God did that? So are you saying that the law, let's call it the law of Moses, let's start on the Ten Commandments for, for conversation. Are you saying that, uh, in so many words, that, that that describes the life of Christ and man in his carnal thinking, looks at that and says, I'll achieve that through my own effort? Yeah. Okay, so are you also saying that the law was not given so that, because Paul says, um, he says, uh, you're no longer under the law, you're under grace. Mm -hmm. And in the context of that, in Romans uh, 6, I think it is, the context of that is, you're no longer under sin. Right. So in that context, he's saying, your view of the law is sin. So you're no longer under sin, you're under grace. But, he also, but also in Galatians, it says that the law is a tutor. Yeah. And also says the law is, the ministry of the law is death. So is the law, was the law given so that man, God knowing man would try to implement life himself, given so that he would realize that he couldn't? Because the scripture also says that the power of sin is the law. So I'm a little confused. About well, what was the word of eternal life in the beginning? Christ. Okay, but didn't God tell Adam not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Yeah. Do you see that in the law? Do I, do I see that you should not? Eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the law? No, I don't see that. I see that. And Paul said the law revealed sin for what it was. I had not known sin if it not been for the law. Yeah, well, based on what I just said, which I can't repeat. <laughs> <laughs> no, what, no, 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 don't, don't, don't go back over and say it. What I'm saying is all those, thi all those things you just said are all contained in the word of eternal life. Okay, so there's a lot of times when Paul's talking about the law, he's talking to Jewish people, and they have a very specific thought of what the law would mean. And so would the Gentile people there, the works of the law. Would you call that a carnal thought? Yes, the works of the law, right. right? Paul's saying, listen, it's not the works of the law that justify us. It's not the performing of the works of the law that justify us. Right, right? It's not those things that justify us. It's right. the work of God, he, right? He also says he's explaining it carnally because they can't understand. Yeah. Not that man would be in a system in which sin would be revealed. What we can't, no, well, I mean, hold on, hold, hold on. We can't discount, the, when we think of the law given, we can't discount that it's going to interact with people. And the interaction it's going to have with people is based on what's in their heart, right. not based on what it says. Right, right, okay? Right. So a person who has the carnal mind, when they interact with that law, are going to come out with a completely different thing. And that will reveal to them, right? But that wrong. that way is not the way into life, yeah, it's the way into death. What I was death. trying to say yeah. in the beginning is that the law, again, Ten Commandments in this situation, is describing the life of God and what is in man, which is the wisdom of Satan, looks at that and says, I'll bring that about myself. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And, okay. And so, what, again, my question is so, is one of the purposes for God giving that is so that that thinking in man would be revealed? Well, yeah. That's the word that's from the beginning. I, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't. I mean, you could say it that way, but since it's from the beginning, I would describe it from the beginning. Um, it's just God revealing that thinking isn't the way unto life. Right now, it was in man at that point, but God was always revealing that thinking isn't the way unto life. He was even revealing to Adam in the beginning that tree can't give you life. The strength of sin, meaning that, and it's not the ministry. We have to weigh all the scriptures when you think about these complicated matters. So you can't say the law is the ministry of death as if the law is what brought death. No, I agree. The reason you can't say that is because it just doesn't fit. But also you can go to the scriptures where Paul says that death reigned over man from Adam to Moses before there was even the law given. 
right? So the law, when you want to understand what does it mean that it's the ministration of condemnation or the ministration of death, <laughs> you want to look at that in light of what Paul said in Romans 5. And so what I would say is, is that the ministration of death is that it just ministered to people that death was reigning over them and taking their members captive and bringing forth the fruit of death in them, right? How did it do that? It created, this is complicated stuff for, yeah. for some of you guys. Um, and not, what I mean by that is it's not that you can't understand it. I mean by maybe you just don't care. So please understand what I'm saying. Because you don't have to understand all this to have eternal life. Okay? Well, I just, I just want to throw that in there. But, but listen, I don't want to, yes, yeah, some people do. And listen, all doctrine is profitable. So it isn't like, you know, it, it's all profitable. Paul said something profound. He said the law created transgression. He also said without the law, there was no transgression. So the law created a writ of debt. It didn't create the debt. It put the debt down on a paper so a person could see there's a debt reigning over me. And so the fruit that was coming out of people because death was reigning, the law took that fruit and wrote it down and said that's punishable by death. It was that way to show them, listen, man, death is reigning over you because you're trusting in your own works for life. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. And so the law created transgression so that those people could see the fruit that was coming out of them is not the fruit of God's life. It's the fruit of death. And then they could find themselves saying, well, then I can't be busy with God. I got to be busy with something else then. Right? This way that seems right can't be the right way. You know, the law also said, told Jesus that the way unto life wasn't the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And some people are thinking, well, where the hell do you see that, man? And forgive me for using the word hell if that upsets you. Um, but if you read in Proverbs, the father, the mother, and the son, who is that? The father, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus. And what are they doing with Jesus? Talking to him about the word of grace. Not to forsake the teaching of the spirit, but to wear it as an emblem around his neck guarding his heart guarding his heart from what the loose woman well who's the loose woman it ain't a real woman it's not talking about some physical prostitute there it's talking about notice how it says it looks good her bed is filled with perfume it looks like a nice place to be you want to go there doesn't that sound dangerously like there's a way that seems right unto man the tree looks good for food it looks like it can make one wise. It looks pleasant. And so you see the book of Proverbs teaching the son not to be deceived or confused by that. In the day you're dying on a cross naked, like I said a couple weeks ago, I don't even know when I said it. The, se the thing that seems right is you need to have life. And the thing that seems right when you find yourself naked, listen, I walk out, if all of a sudden I'm in the middle of the stage in there, and all of a sudden I find I'm naked, and you guys are all sitting there, listen, the thing that's going to seem right to me is that I need to find something to cover up. Yeah. Right? It seems like the right way. Right? And so the book of Proverbs is even laying that out to Jesus. Raising Jesus up into the truth. You know. So the law, hold on, Billy, because this is a complicated thought. I, I want to make sure that we, we, wrap, we wrap it all up. Because it is a complicated thought. Um, and there's nothing wrong with people ironing through it and having all the questions in order with which to iron through it. But I want the simple truth for those that don't want to iron through it themselves not to get lost. The simple truth, if you just like that, is that the Old Testament scriptures, the law and the prophets, is the same word that was made flesh in Jesus. That's the simple truth. Right? But... Different people have different gifts and callings. And so they process through a truth different than other people, right? So, man, I know it's a complicated thing I bring out. At the end of the day, I don't bring it out to cause confusion or to get people heady in their brains. I bring it out because I behold the, the church in the world, not just the church in the world, but the grace church. I see this as two-pronged. I see there's a whole section of the body of Christ that has rejected the message of grace. And I see in the New Testament scriptures, when the author of Hebrews found a people that was confused about what God had done in Christ, he didn't just come and say, you're not under the law anymore. But he came and revealed that everything in the law was about Jesus. Yes. And so I see that that's going to help these people, right? Coming and telling people that have rejected grace or that think the Beatitudes is about the work you're going to do, 
they're not going to buy into, it's not going to make sense to them for you to say, well, that was under the old covenant. It doesn't matter anymore. That doesn't make sense to them. And so do you know what will help them is if you come and explain what's really written there and that makes sense to them. But I also see uh, the Grace Church who doesn't really understand the word of grace and they still got this schizophrenic view of God. And I want them to be established in one truth, one truth, right? What's happened is, is we become slothful with the word of truth, right? And we're not busy with the one work that is the work that we should do. And I know using that word is so horrible for grace people. We become so fragile in understanding terminology. But the disciples asked Jesus, what is the work of God that we might do them? Jesus said, believe. James come and talked about being diligent with the work or the word of faith. And so Proverbs is talking about, don't be slothful. Don't be, dil or be diligent. Don't be a glutton. Listen, it's not talking about eating food. It's not talking about don't eat too much chocolate cake. When it's talking about not being a glutton, it's talking about the word of faith. It's talking about not to fill yourself full with the flesh as if it is your food for life. When it's talking about not being slothful, it's saying don't be lazy with the word of truth, with the perfect law of liberty that was made flesh in Jesus. But be diligent with that word. Always think on that word. Talk about that word. Put that word in your midst. Meditate on that word. Share that word with each other. Talk about that word from every different angle. That's the work of faith. Yeah. This faith that God has given to every man, the measure of faith, is powerless to impact us in this world unless we do the work of diligently examining it. Yes. What got me going is Shannon said at the beginning that we, you know, people talk in terms of I'm not under law anymore, I'm under grace as if there were two different things. Yeah. And, that, and then I, I was thinking, wait, she's seeing something that I, I'm not seeing. And so what I'm seeing is now, having talked about it, thank you, is that the law and grace are the same. What's different is Man's sin stained view of the law. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and so man looked at the law, which is the same as grace, and say, I will do that myself. <coughs> yeah. the, so, the way unto eternal life is by performing this law. Right. Instead of seeing that law prophesied that the way is un unto eternal life was the work of God yeah. to give it to you as a gift. Yes. Right? I see, I see it like um, it's the foundation of where you start from. Um, one says that you're separated from God. And one says that you're in union with God, right? And so if you think the law is about you're separated from God and you have to do these things in order to be right with God, you will try to fulfill the promise of the law in your own strength and ability. But if you see the law as I'm not separated from God, that he is my father and he will bring forth the promise of the law mm -hmm. in me. Right, right. And so the Beatitudes is, is talking about it's talking about an attitude of heart. You will, when, when you see that you don't bring forth life and that God brings forth it, you will be poor in spirit, you know? Yeah. And, and so it's almost like Jesus on the cross is a picture of you trusting in, okay, when you see Jesus' reaction on the cross, blessing those who are cursing him, that's the result of Jesus trusting in the Father to bring forth the law in his life. And you see in the Pharisees, them, the, um, the result of them trying to, to bring forth the law and, and with their work, it resulted in them murdering, yeah. you know? So you see the two different. And when we, t when we talk about bringing forth the law, I know what he means, but everybody that listens won't know. I'm talking about the promise. The law promised life, right? And so when, when, he, yeah. when he talks about God bringing forth the law, He's not talking about God coming and bringing forth all the right behavior in you. Although, when you receive, when you're persuaded you have eternal life, you will find love manifesting in you. But that's not what we're talking about. Because some people want to put the focus again on the behavior. That's not where the focus would be. And that's not what he means. Mm -hmm. And just so everybody else knows, many times when I come, I'm not correcting what you said. I know what you mean. And I think we know what you mean. But there's many people all over the world yeah. that don't understand our terminology and don't know us. And we want to make sure they know what we mean exactly you know i was thinking that uh probably the best example of the misunderstanding of 
the truth in regard to law and grace is the church itself. Yeah. I mean, you, you look at what the vast majority of yeah. people in Christianity believe, they will tell you, we are absolutely not under the law. Oh, if you ask some, are you under the law? Oh, absolutely. But their understanding of what the law is, is the sacrificial system and the ritualistic system. Right. They say, we're not under that law. We don't have to present a sacrifice. Jesus is our sacrifice. It's a good thing to know, to understand. But they will say this, we are definitely still under the moral law of God. Because in their minds, their sin-stained conscious minds, they cannot believe that Jesus is their righteousness. They are still out seeking to establish their own righteousness. And that comes from their, the sin-stained conscious that came from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They believe that by their deeds, they are going to perform that which is right and not do those things that are wrong. They're just believing in a, really a satanic message. And, I, and I'm not saying believers are all believing a satanic. Their, their practice is out of the way. I, don't, I, I guess that's the best way to say it. But if they understood that Jesus is their righteousness, they would no longer be seeking to perform those acts of righteousness in order to attain righteousness. And we, and we just have to even understand what those things are talking about. Paul coming to this, do we make void the law through the preaching of faith? You know what he says? No. Right. He says we're actually establishing it. So, the works of the law, we're actually preaching the faith. <laughs> if you looked at it the right way. Yeah. Well, now that faith has come, we don't look at that for faith anymore. We look at the faith that came in the flesh. And so that's what it would mean to no longer be under the law. If you were actually under the law in the right way, you would look at the, the Exodus, the Passover, and that was designed to give you faith. It was designed to tell you not by strength of God, your hand, but by strength of God's hand. That's what it's supposed to tell you. If you're eating the Passover dinner, you're supposed to be thinking about how God come and took you by the hand and led you out of Egypt. And how you didn't do anything. And how God caused death to pass over you. And you didn't do anything. God did it. How you walked all through the wilderness and nobody got hurt or old or died or nothing. God did it by strength of God's hand. Well, Jesus is here now. So when we want to be persuaded of not by strength of our hand, but by strength of God's hand, we're no longer going to sit and have a Passover meal. We're going to look at Jesus. And that's going to persuade us. Look what God did to cause death to pass over us. Look what he did to lead us out of captivity. Look what he did to set us free from trying to make ourselves a body that can't die. Look at what he did. So to not be under the law anymore is, is we don't look to that to find the faith. We look to Christ to find the faith. And that's what the author of Hebrews come and did. You guys are busy looking to these animal sacrifices to find your conscience purged from sin. But those animal sacrifices, we're talking about Jesus. He's the once for all time sacrifice for sin. So in the day you want your conscience to be cleansed from sin, you're not going to look at those animal sacrifices because they can't actually do it. You're going to look at the once for all time sacrifice, which is Christ. And that will persuade you that you've been divorced from death, right? Right. Because you'll see a human being that's your high priest that represents you. You'll see him standing there free from death. Whose death? Your death. And you'll see him standing in a body that can never die again. And you'll see that human in the holiest place at God's right hand saying something about you and what God thinks of you. And now that will purge your conscience from your death. Because you'll behold an immortal human being as God's <laughs> word about you and your life. And that will purge your conscience from your body of death. Because you're beholding a human being that has immortality in their body. And that will purge you from beholding your dying body. You'll behold that immortal body as the body God has promised you. And that will bring you in there. Right? It'll purge your conscience from sin. Whereby there's no more sacrifice for sin. That's right. No more sacrifice. That's right. So you behold yourself in the face of God when you behold an immortal human being. Now you start to see yourself in God's face. Now that purges your conscience from seeing yourself like Adam did. Adam didn't think he was a son anymore. He didn't think God was his father anymore. He said, God has immortality. God is wrapped in light and life. There's no darkness in him. But I'm wrapped in death. 
There's only darkness in me. How can I be his son? How can I be his father? I'm an orphan in this earth. Well, now we behold an immortal human being that is the representative of us. That purges our conscience from our body of death. And it tells us we are the sons and daughters of God. And that tells us God is our father. We're not orphans. And now we call out to God. Right? right? Sorry, Billy. That was a That's complicated right. thing. <laughs> out, huh? No, no, you're fine. You're fine. I'm enjoying it. Real quick, it, it, it's kind of a, a we had a synagogue when I was growing up down the street, the other end of town, and on Saturday when it was a Sabbath, they would, they after the temple, they would walk and they dressed to the nines and the wife would walk behind the man and the kids behind the mom with like little ducks, you know, as cute as could be. And uh, we were, my buddy and I were driving down the street and he goes, Billy, what are those tassels, what are those hanging from the men? If you're 13, you get them, it's 738 laws. Sharia laws and all these laws you have to follow. He goes, damn, I can't even handle the ten. How do they do it? I said, well, they don't. They, you know, I, and I, I, I wasn't even a Christian yet, but I do remember, I, and I, you know, I'm ignorant of TV, and I don't know movie stars, but there was a movie, I do watch movies once in a while, there was a movie with a while ago with uh, two guys from the city that went out for a western adventure, um, and there was an old rugged cowboy there, and he told the young man, they were trying to find life, he said, there's just one thing. So the whole movie, they're trying to, what's the one thing, you know? So we could say, there's only one thing, Jesus resurrected. Amen. Yeah. And to, to touch on what Billy talked about, Jesus mentioned all those laws they have on their tassel. That's what Jesus, people like to study scriptures, that's what Jesus is talking about. He says, woe, and you scri- woe is you, scribes and Pharisees, for you broaden your phylacteries. The phylactery was the thing you were supposed to write the law in. And it's a little box. You guys saw me. I whipped out that little box. And you would have it on your head and on your arm. You're supposed to keep it in your mind. And you had it on your arm. Why did you have it on your arm? Because every time you look to your own arm to inherit blessing in life, you would see that law telling you, not by strength of your hand, but by strength of God's hand. And so there was only a couple of things they had written in there. One of them was, you shall have one God, the Lord your God. And that meant you shall shall not have any other gods other than me. Well, what is other gods? The works of your own hand. Another one was by strength of God's hand, he led you out of Egypt, not by strength of your own hand. Right? And so there was four of these things. All of them pointed to God. One of them was God giving you the promised land by a gift and not by your works. And so there was like three or four things that were supposed to be contained in these phylacteries, all pointing to God's righteousness towards you. Well, they added all these things to it. That they're going to perform in order to have blessing in life. And Jesus comes and says, woe is you, scribes and Pharisees. You broaden your phylacteries and you've forgotten what the law is even saying. Right. You don't even know what it's saying. You've added so many things to your phylacteries that you're busy talking about how you've given a tithe of your tumen and your mumen and your human and all this kind of stuff. It's like if we were eating, it's like if we were eating hummus, hummus and we, would, we t- cut out a tenth of our hummus and we want to go and offer that to God. You see how ridiculous that is? So listen, guys, real quick. Um, I don't know if you already told everybody, 